Uh, I feel really honored to be here, uh, uh, to be on the same stage with Mr. Ambassador, and uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here. You know, it's always a refreshing experience to, uh, to attend any B-School event. It's all flashy, well-organized, and nice pictures. So I have not so nice pictures and not so nice stories, but I, but I want to give you a sense of how the Chinese compete. But because earlier this morning I uh, heard so much praise about California, so I have to admit that although we live in Beijing, we still keep a house in Palo Alto, so we go, go there every other month. And so, uh, so I am you know, bi-coastal, except the ocean is fairly big. Uh, <laughs> I came to Sweden actually this time uh, to, to, uh, to attend an event at the parliament where we talk about how the, uh, you know, Sweden could uh, participate in the next stage of, of uh, creative, innovative efforts. And if I attend it, and you get the impression that the lack of entrepreneurs is the biggest problem here. Because last time I came to Stockholm was 1998, before this school was born. But if I, I, I had attended such an event beforehand, I would have probably advised the politicians there that it seems the single best use of all the EU money that coming to, to innovation is to dump that sum among the crowd here, and some of like all the Swedish problems will be solved. So it's very encouraging. However, uh, you really need to understand uh, where China is coming from. Because at the global stage, you are not only competing with entrepreneurs in the same city, you are really c competing with them ev everywhere, right? And I think Palo Alto, people around Palo Alto understand this much better than many other places. So I want to, I have more s things on my slides that I can talk about within the time uh, span here. So I will show all the slides, but I'll only pick the most scary stories. Okay, so if you read Chinese, that's a very famous phrase. So when the, I, I want to explain why they're you know, here, because when the Chinese suddenly were told that you could actually engage in business, there was a saying that out of a billion people, 900 were already doing it over, overnight. The other 100 million were thinking about it. So, so you have lots of them coming, really. And the internet bubble and everything has really set examples. People know that the Chinese, they don't have to go to the West. They can succeed you know, at home and make more money. And because you know, the jobs are not secured, you know, they are really motivated because uh, they don't have a pension to go to. They don't have state benefits like you, you had to get here. They don't have medical coverage, you know, right? And so they have no bottom line. Any actual thing is, uh, is uh, uh, gravy, right? So they have to go for it. <coughs> and I want to tell you that there are certain things <coughs> that are really different in China. You know, China, you, know, you could say China is just like any other country in a different stage, right? But it's a very, you, you need combination. The large number of people coming out of poverty, but <coughs> combined with the relatively low cost of living, you create the right environment for people to engage in entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Yes, thank you, thank you. Great, and I want to say this out front is that China is not all positive. Pick any books on China, you can talk about the positive, the negative, the good, the ugly, the whatever, right? So uh, I can spend the same time here. I can spend the whole day here talking about how bad China is, right? You know, there's no real you know, innovation in China, right? And, you know, value added is tiny because they're all made by foreign nationals. Uh, you know, nothing. Really? <coughs> Still, it's very troublesome. Why? Just show you an example. You might have read the Financial Times this past week. The first article there shows you Chinese-made handset, great markets, 
right? It's going to take 13% worldwide share this year. That means the company MTK, who is supplying supplying all the solutions, is the third largest mobile phone maker you have never heard of. They adopted a business model where instead of selling chips, they sell chips plus everything else except the cover, so that thousands of other firms could make the final product. This is what you call mass customization, right? And they literally spawned thousands of firms where the average number of employees per firm is about four and five. And it's those people who make 13% of market shares of cell phones, and they came from nowhere two years ago. Right? And of course, you read this, right? S several years ago, people would dismiss Huawei as a me-too company. Well, yes, it's a, it is a me-too company, but when they take $2.9 billion of contract out of your neighboring country and you are going to lose 5,800 jobs, that's a real issue, right? So I hope you have waken up by now and pay attention to what I'm saying, right? And <clears throat> okay, you can read. And I want to emphasize fast. People, when people talk about labor in China, they talk about cheap labor. And I tell you, not only they are cheap, they compete on price. If you want a service in Beijing, you call the number of you know of the company for you know service provider is either they come right now or later today or they're not going to get a business because somebody somebody else will. So it's not only cheap, it's also fast. And later I will tell you that it also can be very high quality. You look at this, you 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 say, well that's actually sound like parrots. They are in many aspects. <clears throat> But I'll tell you why they are competing like this. I got a quote from a Communist Party secretary of the richest village in China is that they don't have, you know, they haven't gone to a school of entrepreneurship. They haven't gone to any school, right? They're just liberated from this communist system. They're saying, well, we will do anything to make, make money, right? Picking one way is really risky. We want to do everything. So that's really the spirit. This, I will just say that, oh. <coughs> well, yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a political underpinning behind this, which is you might think that China is a one-party system, so therefore everything else is c controlled. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the consequence of having one party in control, that the party has to give back lots of space for freedom, because otherwise the country will explode. So, so on the one hand of the bargain, you get the, con the controlling power. On the other hand of the bargain, you have to let people do whatever they want, up to the, the, the limit that they don't challenge your, 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 your position in power. So that's really the source of everything. And they, don't have, they haven't gone to a business school to learn the right business model. They haven't subscribed to the Western specialization uh, uh, paradigm. So they will make any money, you know, make money anyway, right? So this is a shopping site, but it's not a, a, a online shopping company like eBay. This is an instant messaging site. Well, once they got several tens of millions or hundred millions of users, they said, why don't we uh, make money by selling goods? And if you tell Microsoft, where I used to work, uh, tell them that MSN should start uh, having a shopping site attached to the messenger service, and people will laugh at you. See, that's not what we do, right? Well, China, they, they are not inhibited by anything like, like this. <coughs> and you say people use coffee. Well, Chairman Mao said, it's okay. We were taught, you know, using the little red, red book. <coughs> And the thing I want to emphasize is that lots of people think that China should change. Yes, China will change, more or less, right? However, you can't expect them to change the way that you want them to. You know, I've seen many politicians, especially the U.S. ones, going to China and saying, this is wrong, that is wrong, you know, you guys, this is all wrong. You should all change, 
right? <laughs> and if you couldn't persuade them to change 10 years ago, I think it's going to be very hard for, for you to persuade them today. So this is a perfect example of how you take a little slogan from a red book and carry it to the extreme. It's not an iPhone, it's a my phone. <laughs> Extremely like an iPhone, right? It's none of the iPhone, it's, it's just a simple cell phone. It satisfies the need who, who you know, the people who are uh, sort of, they like the iPhone form factor, the, the, the look and feel, but they don't have the money to pay for it, and they, they don't want to buy anything off the, you know, apps, uh, the iPhone store. So $100, you buy this from a very respected company. It's not a fly-by-night shop. And then people say, well, the iPhone form factor is actually not good for China. It's too big for Chinese hands. They say, okay, so we'll make a latest phone. <laughs> you know, just a little bit smaller, right? And <clears throat> the other thing you have to realize, the competition is, is cut through at, at home. So people who survive such a harsh environment at home, when they come at you, it's going to be really brutal. Uh, you know, after the Cultural Revolution, people lost all sense of trust. You know, they basically trust nobody except their family members, and sometimes not even family members. So, so they have a whole different business model when they don't have trust. You don't partner. You are not specialized. You are vertically integrated. You try to disintermediate anybody else. Right, you get to reach the customers. Whoever gets the customers gets the business. And it's a huge damaging thing for Western companies because the Western companies operate on trust. You, you, you see they, they partner, they specialize, they have this uh, food chain, right? You know, we have an invention, we have a component that fits in, in, into a product that gets into a solution and then gets sold to a customer. In China, you get them anywhere inside that chain, they are going to expand both ways until you are gone. So this is a very good e example. Wan Xiang is, a, is they started by all, being an outsourcer for auto product. They got the same, the first contract from Schiller in 1984. And they made things cheap, you know, good quality, and they eventually bought Schiller. Not only Schiller, they bought 30 other companies. And it's one of the biggest, right? And of course, this is a recent story, right? The French food company partnering with the wrong guy in China getting really burned, which I don't have time to go into there. But the second thing I want to tell you is that the competition from China is not just low, cheap labor. The brain power there is getting really serious and in surprising ways. <coughs> and, oh, okay, well, It's okay. So I will, uh, I think uh, the opening speaker, I think, talked about brain circulation or something like that. You know, people travel, travel back between hotspots. And I really encourage you to read this, 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 you know, these books because they really show you. Sorry, I, I was trying to help you. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. Okay. You, are we where we want to be? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's okay. Okay, so when people say, you know, Western companies are expensive, it's not that a single employee is expensive, it's everybody is expensive. So what China has learned is that they don't have to hire everybody as expensive. They can pair a few expensive people with a few thousands of low cost labor, and they will make products that will surprise you. So I pick a every, you know, everyday life company. Look at that piano. That's a Boston brand piano. I'm not sure many of you have heard. That's the brand that's made by Stanley. Stanley is the number one brand in piano, and that's Boston piano, right? It's made by this company called Pearl River in China because they started by making really cheap pianos. Once they got some money, they went to Germany, bought a line, hired a few very expensive German experts, and they got the quality up. 
They don't have to pay everybody a German salary, but they are successful in taking huge market share. Now, if you buy a Boston piano, you are buying a Chinese-made piano. That may surprise you. And if you think about Facebook, you know, you think it's the largest social network on the planet. It's wrong. In terms of users, the, the service called QQ Zone in China is the largest social network. Once, a, once again, it's built by a few people who are paid very highly. So I, actually, the, the division head used to work for me. And he got frustrated with Microsoft, and he left, and he joined QQ, and uh, he, he was told to build something like Microsoft uh, Amazon Spaces. And here we are. He has built a very large uh, social network, in fact, the largest. Right? So, so people in China are competing with their cost advantage in very surprising ways. So don't dismiss them as me too or low, low uh, cost, cheap labor, low quality. They can be very surprising. And this, I, you know, they, of course, once they have money, they have everything, right? So I want to call this thing is that according to one, one report from out of Harvard, Chinese firms bought close to 300 German companies in 2003. That was shocking. You know, I never heard of it right, until I read that report. So the Chinese are everywhere. You know, they, they come you like water, right? <clears throat> and here I want to impress on you that even though China has all the problems, right, it only takes the success of a few uh, percentage, a small percentage of Chinese and, uh, companies to make life really hard for everybody else. You don't need the whole China to succeed. In fact, it's very scary to, to imagine that most Chinese com companies succeed because that's going to be a huge problem, right? So size really matters. And I, I, I want to show you, a uh, official figure says returnees, people who are educated in the West and work in the West who return to China, the number has been going up every year. The latest figure for last year was 50,000 people. That's the entire workforce of Nokia worldwide. That's about two-thirds of Ericsson. So think about it. Every year, uh, the entire force of Nokia, Western educated, experienced, showed up in China and said, I want to work there. So y you can imagine how competitive the competition from China will be. And I want to tell you, end by giving you a, a tale of where size could enable you to do surprising things. I went to the so-called the largest restaurant in Guangzhou last year. And you say, well, yeah, China, everything is big, large, right? So you size, right? So, so what's the, what about the largest restaurant? Well, you have more rooms, you have more tables, you can take more diners, yes, yes. So they took over a hotel, old hotel, con converted every room in, into a private dining room. So you say, what's f funny about that? Except they went one, f one step further. The restaurant only cooks stuff. The restaurant doesn't have any stock. They, in fact, leased the front floor, the, the ground floor, to vendors. So you walk in, you have competing vendors selling you fish, oysters, uh, shrimp, lobsters, vegetable, meat, everything. And you go to this and say, oh, this fish is great. Steam, s steamed fish, this one, great, gone. You say, six oysters, they are fried, great, right? And you went upstairs and the dish showed up and you pay one bill to the restaurant. So this restaurant operates on such a high margin because they don't keep stock, they don't, right? Their size enables them to create a whole new business model where they create a good experience for the customers. So I want to say that I give you all these stories because, not because I'm pro-China, you know, I, I'm just telling you what you should expect from China and be aware of it. And I will uh, conclude by saying, yes, the West still has lots of advantages, but you'd better be able to utilize that. How? I do not know. But I do have a few feel feelings that 
all those things you could do. And by last, I just want to tell you about the dual, dual SIM card phones. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of a, a, a one cell phone containing two SIM cards. It's a local Chinese innovation, makes life very easier for people who have more than one phone number. Uh, it costs 50 cents more to make than a phone with only one SIM card. And that's an innovation that's going to invade the rest of the world. I heard that Nokia initially dismisses this as something wicked, but now they're internally looking into it. And I should probably just uh, stop there, having told you so many scary stories. <laughs> interesting. Le Gong, thank you so much. Thank you. Please. Now, would you like to sit right. next to each other, or shall I be in the middle? Would you like no, to No, we're friends. <laughs> okay. Wow. A lot of groundbreaking things happening here. So, yeah, I just have to... Ambassador, you have to... I mean, <coughs> you you heard a lot of things here. What's your spontaneous thought? Thank you. <laughs> Tap. <laughs> okay. Was there anything in there that you thought was particularly towards what you said in terms of engagement? Interesting or impactful or scary? Absolutely. I mean, I think... Um, and thank you again. I learned a lot <coughs> from that. I mean, I think so often in the press, and you, you know, you talked about the good and the bad in these different books that, that emphasize the extremes. Uh, that's not what I think about when I think about China and the U.S., two great countries with innovative people in them trying to do things. You talked about QZone, I think, the social network, and I think about President Obama's call for global engagement, and I think more social networks that are vibrant all around the globe I don't want to speak for Facebook, but I mean, you know, only one player. I mean, Facebook's done amazingly well, and, and growth of other social networks, this is not a zero-sum game when we talk about social networking. In fact, new players make the whole network richer, and when you connect networks to other networks, the whole thing, as we've learned from the Internet, makes it stronger. So I'm encouraged by that part of your story. Right. Well, let me, let me just... Because you, you're an ambassador talking about social networks, and a lot of people say, yeah, well... Twitter and Facebook, two, two applications. And that's that their, their grasp of social networks kind of stopped there. It's great for telling other people what you're having for breakfast, but you know, after that, so that when you seem to have a deeper um, thought about social networks and, it's, and the way it's changing the world, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Well, I don't know if it's deeper. I mean, I look at both those brands that you mentioned, they're doing an important part. The one I learned about today, they're clearly doing an important part. I, um, events like today, you know, physical people really getting together in the same building. Uh, Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship itself as a great example of pulling together minds and talent from multiple different institutions. I'm sure how many people here have watched TED Talks at TED.com? Anyone? There we go. How many people have been to TED? How many people have been to TED? <coughs> okay, so I just <coughs> had to kind of throw that into the mix. Well, that's interesting. I mean, what is 5,000 bucks to go to TED? Free. Six. Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Diplomatic discount. <laughs> yeah. No, okay, I don't, wow. I've never been. <laughs> I've never been. I didn't get a discount. Um, but think about that. So you bring all together, uh, you know, this wonderful group of people. You've been. I have not. Um, in one place. And all the goodness that that happens there, and then sharing it all to the world. We all raised our hand. We've watched them for free on our computers and on our phones. And their tagline is, ideas worth spreading. So th that's a, a new type of network and letting ideas share that I think is very exciting. I can change things. Now, we, obviously, we have questions at, at SSES <coughs> underscore at Twitter. We have a Twitter correspondent sitting somewhere. If you want to ask a question, there, the, you know, the good old analog hand race might also suffice, because this is... You know, so just if you want to raise your hand and talk, do so. Now, Li Gong, back, back to you. Um, it was fascinating. I don't know if it's scary. China, uh, to a lot of people, is kind of, like you said, it's full of contradictions. It's strange what to make of it. What's the biggest misunderstanding about China, would you say, the most commonly spread myth that you follow? Well, there are so many. <laughs> Basically, any... Most of the headline stories that you read about China are off mark, right? So China is not really one coherent system, right? And they come from 
I think the most uh, misunderstood part is that they, they think there's this one party that controls everything and everything follows from that. Uh, and that's entirely wrong. Most of the stuff that's happening in China are actually bottom up. And people have a very different conception of what some terms are. You know, for example, innovation in the West, you <laughs> think about creating a new technology, doing something other people haven't done before, because this is how you get venture capitalists to <laughs> invest in your business, right? Mm -hmm. Where you China come from, uh, where most of the people there are on poverty lines, their number one issue is how do I improve myself and my family? So when they think about entrepreneurship, when they think about innovation, they are looking at where's the margin? Where can I make some money? Me too doesn't bother me. Me too bothers venture capitalists, but doesn't bother people, uh, you, know, you know, other people. So if uh, one company is ma making a big business with 20% mar uh, margin, the other guy say, wow, that's great. I don't need 20%, 10% is pretty good for me. And so he put in some money, he started venture, he grabbed some share. And the next guy said, I don't need 10%, 5% is good, good enough, right? So people really operate, compete in a very alien environment. If you try to use Western frameworks to, under, to understand that. So that's really the misconception. You can't apply lots of the Western thinking. Because in many <coughs> cases we don't have double digit growth. I mean, I thought here when you said me too, we have, <coughs> I think, 20 shopping malls around Stockholm. All of them look the same. And I was speaking to Dr. Nordstrom this morning. Why would you go to Naka when you go to, could go to Shista? <laughs> and they have a me too. But the problem there is that number one makes about 6% margin, number two makes minus five, number three makes minus 20. And, and so that becomes a problem. But I understand what you're saying. That frame can't be applied. Right, so, so the fact that there, there are so many hungry, motivated people coming into the world, coupled with the fact that China is, is in a super growth mode, you know, this is what, what is so scary. You know, if you remove either one from the equation, the whole picture is different, right? So, uh, uh, and the size, of course. So, so James Farrell, who wrote the uh, postcard from Tomorrow's Square, had a famous quote. Of course, other people have said that the U.S. is currently the only country with the scale that can counter China, right? Right. And, and of course, that's you know pretty much true. But on the other hand, I think when people think about China, they think it wrongly. So, for example, in the U.S., when gold rush happened in the West Coast, people moved west, right? They basically dropped what they were doing on the East Coast and they just went west and did whatever was done there, right? But if you talk to foreign business owners, you know, multinationals. When they think about China, they say, oh, I want to, great, that's a gro gross economy. I want to participate. How? I want to sell them what I'm making now. That's the wrong way to talk about it. You know, people, real business people go, go there and say they drop whatever they, they do. They bring their money, expertise, and time, and effort, blood, you know, whatever, sweat, and they say, okay, so where can I contribute and make some money? Not how do I make, how do I bring my you know, Swedish-made army knives and try to make it work in China. You know, that's the total wrong, uh, wrong end to look at. This, you know, uh. Right. Well, <coughs> let me, so Ambassador, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. But Ambassador, you talked about the concept of lagom, uh, almost intranslatable, and you said how it's a good way of describing what you're after in the term, in the engagement. Now, a lot of Swedes, people have grown up here, say that Lagom, you know, it's a bit of an inhibitor, especially when it comes to creative thinking, innovative thinking. Uh, Richard Florida, as you know, he's talking about the, uh, the need for a high level of, 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 sort of gay and lesbian people to be innovative. What, what's your thought about outrageousness, I guess, versus Lagom as an innovative catalyst? Uh, okay, well, I guess I think um, my understanding of Lagom in three whole months of living here in Sweden. So uh, I defer to you on, on the interpretation. But from my experience in Sweden, the exciting part and the engaging and innovative part of Lagom, as I understand it, is I think the happy blend of form and function. I mean, in your presentation, you made, fo you know, you looked at the iPhone as the thing that those folks were copying. And just look at people looking at an iPhone in the airport and they're smiling. 
you know, they just look at their expressions and it's, it's accomplishing a task for them and it's pleasant, you know? And I won't mention other brand names, but other things are functional, but they don't make people smile. And I think um, uh, in Swe there's lots to smile about in Stockholm and in Sweden in terms of, I mean, a little single silly thing, but in all the meetings I go to with Swedes, there are beautiful uh, coffee mugs laid out and beautiful little treats and coffee for everybody. That sounds like, and it, you know, it's the number one per capita coffee consumer, I think. And <laughs> Starbucks is about to come to the airport. I heard that, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> That's fascinating. Any, any questions from, from the auditorium? Yes, in the back. I will repeat the question if you shout it out. Thank you. I will repeat oh. my question to Mr. Li Gong. I understood from your presentation that it's important in China that it's cheap, the goods or the things you sell. But in the Western world, branding has become very important. And all of us, most of us, pay a lot for things which doesn't cost so much to produce. But because of the brand, I can buy, pay 1,000 crowns more for a pair of jeans instead of the real price. So how important is branding or how important will branding be in China on the market? Okay, so I think we all heard, heard the question. So branding is very, very important, right? So that's why Prada uh, and, uh, and such brands are, are, are doing e extremely well there, even though you have parodied copies you know, elsewhere, right? So, uh, so brand is, a, is a one of the major advantages that Western companies have. And of course, they keep building on that, oh, right? So, so, but uh, China is coming because uh, you really need to have money first. You, you know, so in in the U.S., there's a phrase in the in in English, I guess. The phrase is that to to do good, you have to do well first. And I think China is coming where a they want to satisfy the domestic needs, so where kind of good enough is okay. So they you know, call some wells together. Then they start to go up the chain, and of course, I really don't want to mention the Geely Volvo uh, story here because he's right in the middle of this hot debate, right? And but that's an example, and the piano is another example. And uh, I think China has got a large percentage in the container business, uh, where they. They acquired uh, century old or whatever you know brand brand names from the UK from from Germany. Right? So, brand is certainly where the West lead by a large large margin. But I think the catch up speed from China is going to accelerate because the infusion of returnees and 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 frankly Western people. We had one more question from from the person right over here. <coughs> Uh, hi, just a question uh, to follow up. Uh, you were mentioning that so many Chinese companies are buying Western European companies and Western companies. How do you think these companies are going to change with new Chinese owners? It's hard to say because, you, 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 in fact, somebody asked me the question, what do you think about the Geely Volvo deal yesterday? Uh, and I can't really tell you because I think the business has come to China so recently. Think about it, you know, business has been to China for only 20 years, basically. Uh, so most of the businesses are first generation companies. And most of them are run by their founders. Most private companies are, right? So it really depends on the individual. So they haven't had a long track record to demonstrate whether they're enlightened or they are not enlightened. So, so I I think right now for any individual case is a flip of a coin because you don't really know what will happen. You know, Lenovo bought the IBM PC business. As far as I can tell, they kept their their Western operation fairly independent. They of course took, took over purchasing and, and 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 some other parts, but they kept the branding and everything else in capable Western hands. But you also see other stories where where they you know, buy a company and totally take over. 
We're so almost out of time, but, uh, but Ambassador, you wanted to ask one, and we have a Twitterati question here as well. So Wait, just one quick question. In one of your final slides, you put up a teaser. I don't know if anyone caught that, but it said, keep the pirates at bay. <coughs> teaser, and you didn't have time to get into it. I was wondering if, if you could give <coughs> us a little bit okay, more so about that. So the, so the teaser was about, right, so the big point I is that if you don't attack the home, sir, uh, the home territory of the pirates, you know, they will always come after you. Right, and if you are always in defensive mode, you are not going to conquer them because they are going to, you know, the the fight is asymmetric. They will come to you, right? So you really have to think about going to China, participating in the economy, probably win something there, dominate there. So how do you do it? And you, you say, well, most of the multinationals are doing that, right? Most of the Fortune 500 companies have already gone to ch China. But from my experience, well, I used to work for, you know, Sun. You know, which was a very you know bright star, right? And I saw so many, of course, Microsoft, and saw so so many stories. I think that the most multinationals, if not all, go to China with a colonial mindset. They see that as a, a sales market, uh, as a territory, and they just send a few expats and take it o over. But that never works. And you ask them, why don't they hire the Chinese, right? And that's the teaser, because they will, whoever hired capable Chinese will lose jobs themselves. This is the difference between all the motivated, hungry Chinese companies versus the multinationals. When the founders run a company, they want to make the company go far, succeed by all means. They don't care anything else. The number one job, on the other hand, for multinational manager, including the CEO, is to keep his or her job. It's not for the company to succeed. It's not for the share to go up. It's to stay in his job. So that's extremely uh, evident when you look at the multinational manager, country managers operating in China. They so often they sacrifice the long-term interests of their companies in order for you know keeping their jobs. So that's the teaser. So basically. I think even though multi companies are going to China for the longest time, they are going there the wrong way. Even though they su succeeded to a large extent, they could have succeeded much more if, if they improved their, how they operate, and they are going to succeed less unless they, they change their ways of behavior. Li Gong, Thank thanks. You. I'll just one final. There was some from Twitter here. Don't forget that Western civilization has copied China throughout history. So, Ambassador, when will the U.S. start copying China? <laughs> it's Twitter. It's the brilliance of Twitter. Like, they don't have to put their hand up, so they're like, <coughs> they get away with it. <laughs> when will the U.S. start copying China? I don't know. <coughs> I'm sure it's going on right now. I mean, copying in the sense of borrowing good ideas. I don't. I mean, that's not the way I look at, at the world, these two things, that it's either or. You know, again, I don't think this is a zero-sum game when it comes to the big challenges that confront our globe. Wow. You truly are an ambassador. <laughs> 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 so I want to thank you for coming here. Now, I actually drew you a picture, both of you. But Marie, who kind of runs the show, she said it looked really bad. So I, I had to give you my own book um, <laughs> instead. And, uh, of course, to wake people up to engagement or scare them, here's an alarm clock for you. Oh, thank you. One for you. Here's, here's everything thank we know is wrong. I want to thank you so much. Give them a round of hands. America. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. That was great. Wow.